comes to learning your airplane and learning what to check, I can show you that. But making it a habit, that's up to you. And this is where you make it a habit. Right here where you begin your training as a B-17 pilot. You've got a nice new airplane to start on. Got your forms, weather code, and radio charts? Right here, sir. OK. Our chutes and other equipment are already in the plane. Now, this business of checking an airplane works two ways. It's life insurance for you if you do, but it can be murder if you don't. Here's our engineer. Let's get on with our external inspection. She all set, Mullins? Everything's OK, sir. Good. We'll begin with this right-hand gear. I always begin my external inspection here. It pays to have one definite starting place. You see, the idea is to make a circle tour of the plane, inspecting as you go. Circling saves steps, for one thing, and there's less chance of overlooking something important if you go at it systematically. Actually, this whole inspection will soon go very fast for you. You get so you can spot something wrong as quickly as that. But we're in no hurry today, though, so we'll take things easy. You want to know about your tires for takeoffs and landings. That means checking the slippage marks to see that the tire hasn't turned on the rim, checking the outboard brake line for any signs of oil leakage, and checking the tire thread for cuts, brakes, or other damage that might prove serious. Wheel charts need to be there when the engines are started. And the brake line here on the inboard side should be snug and dry like the other. Now for the oleo. B-17s have beautiful oleos, they say, but they've got to be just right for the ship's load. There's supposed to be an inch and a half of that uh, shiny cylinder showing, isn't there? That's right. Pedo head cover off. Check. Take a squint at the whip antenna. Their tips get knocked off sometimes. Get the hatch, will you, Sergeant? Yes, sir. Now for the other oleo and tire. When you finish with this left-hand gear, examine the turbo wheel on this engine. Look for cracks, especially at the welded joints. Check the wheel itself for clearance three thirty seconds of an inch all the way around and turn the wheel to check balance. Watch for broken or missing bucks in the wheel as you turn it. It doesn't hurt to check the mechanical linkage on the wastegate either. Check the cowling on the nacelle as you go. Want to make sure the Zeus fasteners are doing their duty. Spot the uh, skin covering, access doors on the way? Yeah. Well, here we are at prop number two. You know what to look for here? Sure. Nicks, dents, cracks. Right. When there are anti-iso boots on the prop, watch out for small stones wedged between the boot and the blade. And as you're examining all three blades, you take a glance at the prop governor. What for? To make sure there's no oil getting out, I guess, and to see that those control cables are snug. Check. Take a glance at the engine, too. Sometimes things get wedged between the fins of the cylinders and prevent your engine from cooling properly. All right, check number one engine, turbo and prop, just as we did number two. OK. OK for number one. Check your de-isopole on this side. And on your way back under the wing, see that all access doors and inspection doors are snugged down. The fabric on the ailerons worth checking. They sometimes put an external lock on these controls, don't they? Yeah, you want to watch out for that, especially at strange fields. Check the aileron trim tab to see if it's got too much play in it. Sometimes it has, and you'll want to know about it. That goes for all trim tabs. See that the various antenna are present and accounted for. That one is. And the command set antenna riding high.
Ball turret door secure. Guns horizontal and pointed to the rear. Trailing antenna anchored. And marker beacon antenna, no brakes. The ISO boot on this stabilizer looks okay. Take a look at the covering on that elevator and check the trim tab for play. Okay. Looks okay to me. Check the rudder covering and the rudder trim tab. Keep your eyes open for any damaged spots in the skin. And why to hear, it's a good idea to see if you've got an elevator downspring. If it's on the airplane, you can see it easiest through this tail gunner's hatch. You see it up there in the elevator control arm? Yeah, uh, don't all B-17s have them? A lot of them do, but you should check to make sure. Downspring will affect the trim of a ship, especially on landing. Well, what's next? The repeat on the right wing of the inspection we made on the left. Except, of course, there's no trim tab on the aileron. Check the underwing skin and access doors, engine three and four, including the turbos and props. Do that yourself. I'll meet you here at the door. Right. Okay, for three and four. Does that complete the circle? Yeah. Let's see how she looks inside now. We'll start with the tail oleo. Is she like the others? Not quite. This baby should show about two and a half inches of shiny cylinder. I see. Notice the equipment stored in this section. Look for anything loose. Everything should be anchored down so that it can't move around, even in rough air. That goes for the ball turret, too, before takeoff. See that the handbrake is in this position so that the turret is locked and can't roll when you're making your takeoff run. And don't forget to check the control cables from the tail section right through the ship. Sometimes the boys stick things in them or on them, everything from coat hangers to the pinup girl. You see? But it's no joke if your controls get fouled up with equipment and flight. Check to see that these hand cranks are in place. Let's see, they're for Bombay doors, landing gear, and flats. That's right. Your hat should be secure. And these locking dogs in position. Another very important point comes up here. The plane's loaded weight and CG. They should all be computed for you before you get into the ship ready for you to check. Figuring them is usually the co-pilot's responsibility. I've done it a couple of times. Well, this computer's pretty simple and it's got good written instructions on it. The important thing to remember is to use the computer that comes with the airplane. It's adjusted for that particular plane and it mightn't work on some other B-17. Well, the pilot is mainly interested in these figures from a flying standpoint, isn't he? You've got to check them before every flight, so you'll know exactly what the load is and where it is. Weight and CG affect the trim of a ship on takeoffs and its stability characteristics in flight. And you'll want to know exactly what the effect's going to be. Especially in combat. You can say that again, brother. There's a fire extinguisher to check here. Safety wire unbroken, mounting okay. Good. Let's see about the Bombay now. We're carrying a Bombay tank here today, so any checking done in here can be done by your nose. Any fumes? No, guess not. That's the way you want it. 
This emergency bomb release here is worth a look. The lever's in place, so it's okay. Here, I'll take your briefcase. Thanks. There's another fire extinguisher to check while you're up. It's to your left, right beside the door. It's okay. Anything else, Captain? One more thing. Before you climb into the pilot seat, take a look out the side windows along the tops of the wings. Are all the access doors and covers closed? All closed. Now we start the cockpit check, huh? As soon as you get settled. We use a checklist for all standard cockpit procedures we go through, including this check we're going to make before starting the engines. Make this checklist a habit and stick to it, even when it seems unnecessary to you. Have your co-pilot read the items off to you, even though you could repeat them backwards from memory. It's just a simple list of reminders, but the simpler they seem to you, the more you'll need them. You see, your first impression of this airplane doesn't last. In no time at all, she'll seem a lot smaller to you. Now, you've still got 50 feet of airfoil and a pair of supercharged engines on either side of you but you take it for granted. She handles so easily and she, she flies so nicely. She's a comfortable 10 passenger baby carriage that just keeps rolling along like old man River. She can do everything but think, but she can't think. You've got to do that. In combat, your mind is going to be full of a lot of things beside procedures and yet, you can't afford to make your routine checks mechanically. They can't become automatic. And this is what keeps you thinking about them, along with everything else. Let's go through it. As co-pilot, I'll read each item off. Pilot pre-flight, we've covered that. Uh, form 1A. There's no doubt about the importance of Form 1A. It tells you a lot of things you want to know about the airplane. Uh, be sure to note the exact amount of fuel it says we have aboard. The ship's on a red diagonal, I see, because of some minor defects. Think she's okay to fly? Yes, sir. It's just that compass and the bomb door warning light. Otherwise, she's okay. All right, then we'll sign the exceptional release required of the pilot under the circumstances. That's right. See that you have your radio charts and weather codes. Check form one, the loading and passenger list. Well, are you all set? All set. Okay, how are the props? Have the props been pulled through? All okay, Lieutenant. They're just finishing number four now. Item number three, controls and seats. Don't forget to fasten the seat belt. Get your seat adjusted. The adjustment lever's on the outboard side. You want the rudder pedals within easy reach. Close enough that you can keep your back against the back of the seat and get full rudder. Okay for me. Fine. Now for the control check. Are the controls unlocked, rudder and elevators? They're unlocked. Better check the lock itself. Make sure it's all the way down and latched. Check. Now for the aileron lock. That red ribbon's there as a reminder. Unhitch the ribbon from the throttle. Check. And wind it around the locking pin. The pin goes in that clip on the side of the control column. Yes, sir. All of the control surfaces are visible from here. I'll check full right rudder and the elevator on my side, and you can see the rest of them from where you are. With the wheel forward, give a full right aileron and call out what you see. Right aileron up. Check, right elevator's down. 
Left elevator down, left aileron down. Now give a full right rudder. Rudder full right, check. Now nose up, full left aileron and full left rudder. Left aileron up, left elevator up. Rudder full left. And right aileron down. I'll hold the controls now. Check the trim tabs. First see that the tab indicators are in neutral. The rudder tab control in the floor. The elevator tab control at the side of the stand. And the aileron tab control on the wall beside you. All lined up? Okay, take a look out and see if they are. Trim tab's neutral. Well, that takes care of the controls. A lot of good pilots and a lot of good planes would still be flying today, only they forgot to make that check. Took off with their controls locked or cross-rigged. Let's see. Fuel transfer valves and switch. Off. Now, from here on until we start the engines, this cockpit check is a sort of a circle tour, like our external inspection. Item number five, intercoolers. Cold. Gyros. This one's uncaged, and so's the horizon. They always should be, shouldn't they? On this airplane, yes. We don't intend to do any fancy nip-ups. Fuel shutoff switches. Open. Landing gear switch? Neutral. Call flaps. Open right. Open left. Locked. You want all possible airflow around your engines when starting and warming up. Otherwise, local hot spots might develop that would ruin your cylinders. Turbos. Off? You bet. You want that wastegate open so that backfires during starting won't be bottled up in the exhaust. Idle cutoffs, the next item. The four mixture controls here. Check. They're okay. Throttles? Closed. High RPM? Check. Autopilot? Off. The next items are right down that wall beside you. De-ices and anti-ices, wing and prop. Off. Cabin heat control? Off. Generators? Off. Well, that takes care of the first section. Now we'll get set on the next. Starting engines? Right. Part of our team in this procedure is on the ground. Now, the first item under starting engines is fire guard. There should be a man with a fire extinguisher near each engine as it started. Now, he'll probably be out on your side since we start number one first, then two, three, and four. Is he there? He's ready and waiting. Okay. But make sure there's no one near those props. Warn your ground crew. Props clear. All clear. Master and ignition switches. On. Batteries and inverters. We'll start by turning on the alternate inverter and using it to test our batteries. The inverters change direct current to the alternating current the engine instruments need. Let's check our batteries using the inverter as a guide. Turn on number one battery. Inverter's humming, that means number one battery's putting out. Now turn off number one and put on number two. Number two's okay, now try number three alone. Okay. Turn all three on now and check the voltmeter on the instrument panel. What does it say the inverter's putting out? 26 volts. Check. Now try the inverter on normal. Voltage? 26 volts. Right in the button. We'll uh, leave the inverter on normal. You'll notice that Mullins is keeping an eye on the inverters. Moving the instrument flying curtain away from the inverter so it can get some air. And he's checking to see that there are no metal objects down there that might contact the inverter points and cause a short. Another important point. 
Whenever possible, we use an external source of electrical power to start the engines. To save the batteries? Right. Reach out the window and give the mechanic this. A right to the jaw? That's a hand signal to connect external power. In this case, it's that portable generator you saw out there. Parking brakes and hydraulic check. Brakes on. Pressure? About 800. Check. Booster pumps and pressure. On? Check. Carburetor air filters on to keep dust out of the engine. Fuel quantity. Tanks one, two, three, four. Right and left. All full. OK. We're all set to go. Signal to start number one. I got the OK, but I couldn't see the guy with the fire extinguisher. He's in back of the engine. You see, it's easier for him to direct the extinguisher into the engines from there, through the open car flaps. And there's less danger of his getting excited and running through the prop in case there is a fire. Adjust your throttle so they won't creep when the engines get going. Move the throttle lock up slowly and keep testing throttle movement until there's enough friction to hold the throttles firm, but you can still move them with a fair amount of ease. You got it? Yeah. Close your throttles right down against the bottom. Now we're going to crack them so we'll get about 1,000 RPM from our engines when they start. Uh, how far will that be? Oh, have to guess, but I'd say about three quarters of an inch open. Move the inboards up past the outboards about that far. Now bring the outboards up even with the inboards. That's the easiest way to judge the distance. They'll probably need some adjustments when the tack gets going and we can tell more accurately. All right, here we go. With one hand, I hold the starter switch for 15 to 20 seconds. And with the other hand, I set the hand primer for number one engine and pump it a few times to get the air out of the primer lines. Unlock your mixture control and be ready to pull number one mixture control back as soon as the engine fires. With this newer type starter, you hold the starter switch on while you're meshing it. OK. your oil pressure. If it doesn't rise in 30 seconds, the engine has to be shut down and the trouble investigated. All right? Check your RPM. Adjust your throttle for 1,000. Number one's OK. Signal to start number two. Now, before we start number two engine, set your vacuum selector switch there to left. We want the vacuum pump to start delivering just as soon as number two engine starts, so we can see whether the pump is working OK, and also to see whether the flight indicator is functioning properly. The horizon should snap into position firmly and quickly just as soon as the number two engine starts. All right, let's start her. From here on, it's just like number one. your flight indicator now. OK. Check your other instruments for number two engine. Oil pressure, fuel pressure, RPM. Check. All right, three and four are just like number one.
I'll turn on the radio so it'll be warming up. Get on your inner phone. We can talk easier. Better, huh? Check estimates now, don't we? Yeah. Fuel pressure should be between 14 and 16 pounds. The oil temperature's high enough now that we can advance the throttles to about 1,200 RPM so the engines will warm up faster. Always move the throttles steadily and not too fast. Otherwise, there's danger of backfire, which might damage the engines or the turbos. Now the wing flap indicator. The only way to check it is to operate the flaps. The assistant engineer in the waist can watch the flaps from the side windows. Today, we'll have one of the student waste gunners watch them. Waste gunner from co-pilot, over. Co-pilot from waste gunner, over. We're going to check flap operation. Are the flaps clear? Flaps all clear, sir. Roger. Check to see that the flaps lower evenly and report when the flaps are full down. Roger. Flaps. Check. Now report when zero flap position is reached. Zero flaps. That's all, Gunner. Thanks. Now for the rest of the instruments. Check the ceiling panel and make sure the compass card is able to move freely. Hydraulic pressure? Still about 800. Suction gauge? Four. Okay. Try it on the other vacuum pump. Same reading. Check. Turn the switch back to use the left vacuum pump on number two engine. Now see about our oxygen supply. About 350 pounds on each of them. OK. If we were going to high altitude today, we'd also check our oxygen equipment and test it and call every member of the crew for a report when they'd done the same. See that the various warning lights on the panel are working, and I'll check these on the carburetor air filters. These lights should change about 15 seconds after the switch is operated. It takes about that long for the filters to open and close. OK. I put the filters back on to keep ground dust out of the engines. This check should be made with the engines off if there's much dust around. Now I'll call the tower and get our clearance in our altimeter setting. All in tower. This is 230-641. Over. 641, this is Alden Tower. Over. Alden Tower, this is 641. Request taxi instructions for three-hour local flight. Pilot Phillips, over. 641, cleared to runway 20 to the southwest, over. 641, roger. Request wind information and altimeter setting. Landing code number 27835, over. 641, landing code 27835. Wind direction J jig. Velocity M Mike. Altimeter setting W William 3, over. 641, roger, out. Altimeter setting OK? OK. Throw your engines all the way back, and we'll get ready to taxi. Signal to have external power removed, and wheel chocks cleared. Thanks, clear. Get your throttle set for taxiing. You'll be using the two outboard engines to maintain directional control. Now reset your friction brakes so they'll handle easily. All set? 
All set. Tear wheel unlocked. Brakes off. We're clear. Slow her down a little with the brakes and turn her so she's headed down the ramp this way. Use your throttles to make the turn. Brakes are used to slow the plane mostly. That's it. Always keep the wheels rolling while you turn. If you use the brakes too much on a turn, you'll pivot on the tires. And I've seen brand new tires split right off the rims of a heavy ship because of pivoting. In any case, it grinds off rubber. She's rolling straight now. How do you keep her that way? Tail wheel locked. Tail wheel locked. Make sure your co-pilot keeps his eyes peeled while you're moving out, especially when you're passing planes parked on his side. He can see them if they start to move out, but you can't. We'll switch over to command now to stand by tower frequency while taxiing. Uncover your inside ear so we can talk. We'll turn out of this taxi strip here. Unlock tail wheel. Tail wheel unlocked. Ready for takeoff. There. And in a few months, it's second nature. I hope. Well, as a matter of fact, it'll come to you pretty fast. But don't count too much on that second nature stuff. Count on this. The checklist doesn't skip anything. You might, even after a thousand hours. I'll buy it every time. Roger.